Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, uh, I feel sorry for those of your colleagues and classmates who uh, are otherwise occupied and can't be here now. You're going to hear, I think, uh, a great uh, man, uh, and, a, uh, and you're going to come away with a great bit of illumination. Um, I'm, I come equipped uh, with that dangerously small amount of knowledge, having spent the better part of two years on a National Academy's study about the challenges facing the human spaceflight program. And um, um, I learned a few things there, but one thing I learned immediately was that everyone, I mean everyone, in the world of uh, space exploration and space technology knows, respects, and admires Bill Gerstenmaier. His name came up over and over and over again before the first time he ever came over and, and visited with our commission. And, and um, I, I'm just here to testify that uh, there is no figure probably anywhere right now more highly regarded uh, in the realm in which he's worked since leaving Purdue University in 1977, uh, uh, went elsewhere for a master's, came back, did doctoral coursework here, and has deep ties to our university. And it's hardly the first time he's come back and been nice enough to spend some time with us. But uh, there is no major system or project of uh, the space era, which he has not touched in one way or another uh, since leaving here. Uh, the space station, Mir, um, the, um, uh, each of the major propulsion systems, SLS, um, and, uh, and now holds the job, having done everything else you can do, as associate administrator for human exploration and operations. So there's no question you can uh, formulate that he won't know a ton about. And I, uh, uh, after I uh, ask a few, I hope that many of you will prepare yourself and, uh, and we'll let uh, the audience carry the, uh, at least the second half of our hour together. So thank you so very much, Bill, for coming back to Purdue and, and um, spending this time w uh, today and tomorrow with so many of our faculty and students. Um, I know you're not going to want to talk about this, but just for a minute, talk about yourself. Um, and this great career you've had, it's always more interested in one's own words, uh, why I didn't dwell on it. So could you just talk a little bit about, uh, did you always know, and you certainly headed straight for it. Uh, tell, talk about the ride. Yeah, I'll tell you, it really started right here at Purdue University, and I can't think of a, you know, a better start to my career than, than what I got here at Purdue. And what I really liked about Purdue was I not only got the theory and kind of the, the uh, the mathematics behind the engineering, but I also got the practical side. And I had some really great professors, and I still, they're still out here in the audience today that I still know and still really, really still kind of quiver when I see them in the hall. I, I feel like they're going <laughs> to grade some report for me or finals or look at qualifiers for me. And so there's still that sense of awe and inspiration when I see them. They don't quite understand that, but I, sh I sure still feel that same kind of student uh, student-teacher professor relationship is still there. But it was a great place to really start and to, to really learn how to think and to learn how to analyze problems and to do things, you know, from working at, you know, out at the airport, doing some, some tests out there in the wind tunnels and other things was just great for the university. Being in the structure lab here at Purdue also doing structures was really, really helpful. A big advantage over others that just had more of an academic background. I then went to, to work at NASA Lewis, and now NASA Glenn, in Cleveland, I did aeronautical research there. I did uh, supersonic stuff in the wind tunnels there, again, kind of building off of what I did at, at Purdue. But again, for me, it was a great way to start out because I'm kind of wired to do things uh, with my hands and to see things and to understand how things work. To me, it's more important that I get real test data. I can do the computational stuff, but I like to see the test data to anchor the computational stuff. So, so to get a chance to do all that hands-on stuff in Cleveland was, was absolutely great. I did some early uh, space shuttle stuff, the air data probes that were used on the space shuttle to actually have the space shuttle land on the runway were calibrated in the wind tunnel. And I didn't do much but except just take data and provide it to the Rockwell engineers who then loaded all the data into the air data probes. But, but to have that background and understand how that would be used. And then later when I went to the Johnson Space Center and I actually got to see how much 
people really counted on those probes working and they, how they thought the algorithms were built that actually sat behind the probes. They had no idea how those algorithms were really built. We had a huge debate about what the data was right. We had to go to Langley and Ames and Lewis at the time. We had all three tunnels worth of data. We had to compare them all against each other. There were tremendous debates about what the Cal curve ought to be in to get the, the heading alignment or get the velocity and uh, alignment correct with the runway because we had to be precise. I think a half a PSF was the accuracy and the, and the pressure <laughs> on, that, on that air data probe. And there was no way we could ever get agreement between these tunnels. Each center was out to prove their tunnel was the best, and we ended up taking the root sum square of all three tunnels, and that's the number that, <laughs> that, that went into the air data probe for the shuttle. So then the astronauts would tell me You didn't how, tell the astronauts no, that. No, the yeah. astronauts would tell me how, how wonderful this calibration was and how well the, the, the shuttle flew, and I would just go, yeah. 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 It's, we couldn't decide, so we just did root sum squared, which, which you know what that means. So, Again, I would say just a, just a tremendous experience. Yeah. I've been blessed my entire career. I've never really chosen any path in my career. I just kind of do what's fun and enjoy uh -huh. things and keep moving forward, and, and, and it's been good. Probably the most difficult job now is the one I have now. I have to do that interface between engineering and the politicians, mm -hmm. which, is, which is hard for me to, to make that translation. So, so I thought it was hard kind of getting conversant in Russian and learning to deal yeah. in Mir. Now I'm learning <laughs> the second language of politicians. Yeah. So, so I'm not sure how, I, how you do that translation. So I may have to get some pointers from you and then get some, <laughs> get, get some, uh, some improvement. My, any knowledge I had is dated, so. <laughs> um, so many, uh, we've got so many students here who become excited by their studies and by their faculty and others about careers in space. But I have to say that um, the big majority of the time when I'm hearing that from a student, they're gonna, they start talking about the, the private companies. If you were graduating from Purdue today in aeronautics, um, how would you size up the, um, or if you were here on the faculty advising a student about the choices in 2015, how would it look to you? Again, I think you've got to kind of look at what you want to do with your career and, and how you want, to, you want to advance your career. Again. If, if you want to be in a, in a company that's very fast changing with lots of hands-on hardware experience doing multiple jobs, then one of the new companies is, is the perfect place for you to go. If you're more comfortable and kind of maybe overseeing and seeing the, the bigger picture, but mm -hmm. not as at the depth, but seeing maybe at uh, how different companies do things a different way, you're more, you know, kind of maybe a just looking, looking over the entire horizon and see how things fit together, then maybe kind of a government role is there. Um, I think, again, it just really depends where you are. I think the other thing that's really important today is it's not about, in my generation, most folks kind of stayed in the same job mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. You know, I've been with NASA my entire career. I'd say that's pretty abnormal now. Uh, there's a lot of movement between companies and other areas. And I think that's perfectly fine. So you shouldn't worry so much about getting that first job or going to first place. You know, go there, learn as much as you can, get it challenged, get excited, see what you, you really enjoy, and then go ahead and make a move and experiment and, and don't be afraid. Especially before your family gets started, you've got some ability to move around and, and you ought to take advantage of that and move around and, and follow your passion and follow things that get you excited. And I tell folks, no matter what they do, if you can find something that really gets you excited in the morning, that really you want to get up to go do, and it's not just work, that's what you need to find. And so it may be in engineering, it could be in, in accounting, it could be in, in the law profession, whatever it is, whatever really drives you that motivates you, that's the most important thing. So I wouldn't get too hung up about where I go, but I think it's an exciting time to be in aerospace. Lots of things are changing. There's new ways of doing business, and this is a, a great, great time to be in aerospace. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you a couple questions about the almost excruciating challenges facing the, the space program. And um, one, one I didn't uh, preview with you when we were backstage, but uh, it's a question I think a lot of people ask. Uh, so 46 years this July, if in, on July 1, 1969, if someone had said to you uh, that all those years later, we wouldn't be further than we are, uh, would have probably come as a surprise. Most, most folks had become, we'd seen this incredible rate of progress and rather assumed something like it would continue. Can you talk a little bit about uh, why it didn't, 
how it didn't? Boy, if, if, if I knew the real answer to that, I would fix it, yeah, right? right. And, we would, and we would be moving right. faster, because I, I kind of shared those same aspirations. I, I know when I, you know when I went to the Johnson Space Center in 1980 to begin the shuttle programs before the shuttle had flown its first flight, I don't think I would have ever thought that my entire career would have spanned the entire life of the shuttle program right. or just space station. I would have felt for sure we would have been somewhere beyond low Earth orbit pushing right. out into the solar system with humans. And so I don't know exactly why that's occurred, but, it, but it's, it's frustrating to me. I want us to move at that faster pace if we can, but it's, it's just a... We have a finite amount of resources. We have a finite amount of effort and things we can go do. And, and, and I think we kind of get, get stymied at moving forward. You know, one thing I'm working really hard on is, uh, and we, we discussed it with you at the, as part of the NRC report, is, you know, folks kind of want to go back to that Apollo model where we had a date and a mm. destination, where we're driving for a particular destination by a particular date. And that, that makes tremendous progress. Uh, you, you, move, you move fast but you're not necessarily sustainable. We did Apollo and then there was no method to kind of move forward from Apollo. So we're, we're trying now to, to build a system that is more sustainable, that can cannot get stopped and restarted. And, and we see that a lot with the government cycles. As we go through the presidential cycles, the new team comes in, they form a commission, they come back and tell us what we're working on isn't the right thing and then we get revectored right. into a different dimension. And that slows us down. So I think the idea is, is it's, kind of taking a long view, recognizing it's not going to be as fast as any one of us want, but can we make it sustainable that we're making solid, measurable progress towards that, intimate goal, that, right. that end goal? And that's what we're trying to work on today. Yeah, I think it's um, only natural that a lot of folks who are enthusiasts, as probably everybody here is, for the overall enterprise to overlook some of the incredible um, uh, problems that you folks face and the, just the two that... I guess came out the most to me when I looked more closely. One is this total mismatch or disconnect between the time frames you have to work on. We'll talk about Mars here in a little bit, but uh, even the, the moon when, it, when we started talking about very long time frames uh, in direct contrast to the short-sighted or short-term thinking of the uh, people in the political process and so forth. And, that's one, and then something that even fewer people probably uh, recognize is that public support uh, for space exploration has never been as strong as some of us used to think. And when you look back, even at the time of Apollo, it's interesting how mixed it was. So these are pretty tough realities for you guys. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you go back and you, you kind of look in hindsight, you remember all the good things, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't remember some of the struggles. And if I go back and Apollo was before me, but I read some of the, the information and in fact, the, the plan was to start shutting down the Apollo program even before we landed on the moon in, in July of 1969. So to be thinking that that was going on at the same time they were striving to just to actually land on the moon was, was, was I had no appreciation for how difficult it was. I look back and I think how wonderful it must have been to be in that time frame. It still must have had a lot of the same struggles we face with today where competing objectives, national priorities, things to spend money on, uh, you know, wars, recessions, those kind of things right. really drive government thinking and, and it's hard. But then, then I step back and, and when I think optimistically, I look at our budget that NASA has and enjoys. We have the largest budget of any country that's doing work in space. So this country still sees space as special and we still support what we're doing. It may not be at the level that maybe us enthusiasts would like or us engineers would uh -huh. like, but it's still not trivial in the big scheme of things. So, so my job, NASA's job, is to make sure that the dollars we get are spent in the most effective, efficient manner we can and build some sustainability and keep us moving forward at the yeah. pace that, that we can sustain. Yeah, we just have to hope that your, your achievements, which are stunning, uh, even the in incremental ones you all make, will become more and more appreciated by our fellow citizens. I'm suddenly reminded, um, 19, just to be as a sobering reminder, 1982, so only 13 years, 12 and a half years after NASA, one of the heroes, Jack Schmidt, who had walked on the moon, uh, and had already served a few years in the U.S. Senate, got beat running for re-election, and his opponent's theme was, what on earth has he done? Wow. <laughs> Which, wow. 
you know, <laughs> in a way captured this, this ambivalence that the general public, uh, however thrilling we know these th things to be, um, it, hasn't, we, it needs to be spread more widely. And one other thing I'd add, too, is that, that you, you know, that the cool thing about our business is it's really not any one individual that does this. Yeah. I mean, these challenges we're facing absolutely take the best performance of an entire team. And, and uh, to me, that's when I get really excited. When, yeah. when I can see this team of engineers come together, and, and I broaden that discussion. You talk about the NASA team and the commercial spaceflight team or private industry right. team. I see us all as one team. Mm -hmm. We share the same underlying passion amongst ourselves. And I can see that entire group move forward to, to meet some insurmountable challenge. And I see engineers working and, and accountants and legal folks all pulling together in that same goal. This is ultimately just amazing to me. So, so when I when I step back and I, and I look at this and I see how much these challenges make us, brings out the best in us as a, as a humanity is just, just amazing to me. And, and it's what a privilege we get. I get to see this firsthand. I wish others could appreciate it or get a chance to see it at the same level that I do. But it's just amazing to see a team accomplish these, these really tough tasks very, very efficiently. Well, I'm sure. Well, let's talk about a tough task. Let's talk for a little bit about, about Mars. Um, Mars... Uh, uh, the, our, our commission uh, used the word, it's been used often, horizon goal. I remember using it on stage with our astronauts at, a, at their uh, uh, reunion uh, last year. A couple of them bristled. As they, they thought it meant ever in human history. It doesn't. It means as far as we can see today, and I, which I think is accepted by our international partners and others. And so um, talk a little, uh, 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 let me ask a couple questions about Mars. One is, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the folks on our technological panel identified among many, many daunting um, uh, difficulties that you and, and your successors probably will face, uh, three, uh, entry, descent, and landing, uh, in-space propulsion, uh, time to get there essentially, and radiation danger, radiation safety, did, did, are those the big three? Could you talk a little about them and what else, what else among so many possibilities will be a, a, a tough one for the engineers of tomorrow to solve? Sure, I think those three are, are big considerations for us. I think radiation is really hard for us. Uh, there, the galactic cosmic radiation that uh, comes, from, uh, comes essentially from, from the universe, it, the energy is so high you can't really shield from it. So I'm not sure that there's today a technology solution that really works. You can do some, maybe some kind of magnetic shielding, but that's going to be tremendously heavy. Any kind of shielding is, is just not going to work for this. Now solar particle events, high energy radiation coming from the sun, we can shield from that. Mm -hmm. So I think we can probably get by the radiation problem by going at solar max when the sun is most active because the sun shedding all these particles actually creates a, mm -hmm. a shield that shields us from the galactic cosmic radiation and we can do maybe a 300, 400, 500 day mission to, to Mars and come back and still be close to our radiation requirements we have today. So I think we can get by radiation by, by kind of pushing them. We're still looking at things for shielding. We're also looking, uh, I know the health uh, folks are starting to look at, uh, we're doing some animal studies at Brookhaven looking at radiation limits. And I think there's some studies looking at drugs and other things that may help with the radiation problems. And we need to continue to keep doing that. It's more than just a NASA problem. It's, yeah. a, it's a health problem. But I think radiation probably can get solved. Entry, descent, and landing, big deal. Mm -hmm. We've landed rovers on the surface of Mars, <laughs> roughly a metric ton. We think for the smallest habitation or ascent module kind of thing, we need to land about 20 metric tons. Right. You know, the Martian atmosphere is, is not thick enough to provide significant right. braking, but it's, but it's thick enough that it creates significant heating, so we've got to really work on entry, descent, and landing, and we're starting to do some things there, but that's, that's clearly one. And then propulsion. Getting there fast is, is another way. We're looking at some nuclear uh, propulsion. We think we can, we've got a new concept now where we pre-position cargo. So all the heavy items, they go with electric mm -hmm. propulsion. They may go ahead of time before the crew goes. And then the crew goes on a chemical propulsion rocket and that can get you these kind of times I talked about before. So I think right. we can solve that. 
I think another thing we don't we haven't looked at is the habitation requirement. You know, living in a closed loop biosphere right. on Mars is not going to be easy for any extended period of time. So, you know, we look at things. Um, you know, we tried biosphere here on the Earth, and that didn't work so well. I think oxygen got absorbed into concrete was one of the problems, and, and it just didn't work. We did some, looked at the Mars One experiment where we had plants with the crew. It turns out the plants produce too much oxygen that you can actually um, <laughs> it kill the human because of over oxygen. So, because we didn't have a system to separate. So that environmental yeah. system of systems, life support, thing to keep humans healthy on the surface of Mars, even using the resources from Mars will not be easy. So I think that's a fourth challenge. Uh -huh. so, so I think we basically agree with those three challenges. We handle them in a little bit different ways than maybe the report did, but we're addressing those three, plus I would say habitation is a four. Yeah, less uh, susceptible to quantification, but uh, I remember a lot of talk about, or speculation about the psychological risk, not, not to be taken too lightly, uh, yeah. given the unbelievable conditions that would, uh, folks would have to put themselves through. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I was telling some folks earlier today that you know, I showed a picture from the Curiosity rover, uh, and it takes a picture in it from Mars of, of the Earth, and the Earth mm -hmm. is this mm -hmm. little tiny dot in the sky, and it sits across the, the mountains there on Mars, and it looks a lot like kind of a picture from New Mexico looking at Mars. Uh -huh. and, and I go, if you, you know, imagine yourself, you're there, and that's your home planet, and, and that's where you're from. That's really going to be, I think, hard from a psychological standpoint to deal with that, dis that distance. The time delay of 20, sec 20 minutes or so, mm -hmm. communication delay will be tough. You're going to be much more autonomous, much more alone. That sense of isolation will be real. You know, our crews on station, you know, they take probably 2,000 pictures of the Earth every day. So that, that, that tie to the home planet is really strong. Right. I think even at the moon, you could still see that, that big blue dot there, and, and you could still see continents. So there's still that tie. But I think psychologically, it will not, it will not be easy. We're going to do the one-year expedition with uh, Mark Kelly uh, this, this spring in March. And it'll be exciting to see how that goes. You know, the Russians have gone a year before, but I don't think we've ever gone with this much instrumentation. So we'll really see how the human body performs. And, you know, you know, Scott's a pretty good, has a good sense of humor. We've got a whole battery of psychological tests he's going to be <laughs> taking every week. Maybe we ought to have all the students take those every week throughout the school year to, <laughs> to, to see how your, uh, your psychological well-being ebbs and flows throughout the semester. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see how he does for the, for the one year, and we'll, we'll see what, what comes. But I'm sure we will learn something through that activity, and it'll be, it'll be intriguing. I want to remind everybody, in just a few minutes, we'll be taking questions. So if, uh, I, hope, I hope a few of you are preparing. Well, I know you have to be a little uh, cautious about this, but uh, uh, even while um, NASA and certainly our commission and others um, uh, are... Have, are Come, became are very very impressed with the degree of difficulty to do all these things and are thinking in terms of a couple decades at best. There are people running around saying, "No, no, it's not that hard. We'll be there in 2020x." Um, what do you think they're overlooking, or how? Uh, what do they know that we don't know? Again, I think if you look at Mars, it's a really tough, challenging mm -hmm. problem. It, if I can have a chart here, I, yes. since I'm from NASA, I have to show charts, right? So. <laughs> This is the difference if you're at a private company or NASA. At NASA, you're required to carry charts with you. At a private company, you have a napkin, and you write things out, and you pass out napkins. First time I went to the federal government, somebody said when a NASA engineer, you know, passes on and presents himself at the pearly gates to see St. Peter, he says, first view graph, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is my first view graph. So, so, so this, this is also an example of, if I could show you an earlier version of this, you have like the stick chart version that I did, right, as an engineer, which is not graphically appealing. So this was done by our, our, our public folks that can, can actually make things exciting. But mm -hmm. so, so the difference here is <laughs> there's three directorates. So we see it, this is really a combined effort for us at NASA. So yeah. it's science, exploration, you know, my directorate, and then technology. We think all 
it's just going to take all of NASA to accomplish this Mars kind of activity. And then I think down at the bottom, the things we were just discussing, the Earth Reliant region, that's where we are with Space Station today. We can learn a lot of stuff there. Eventually, we hand that off to the private sector, I believe. I don't believe the government needs to be mm -hmm. in low Earth orbit. That needs, the next space station needs to be a private space station with no government involvement and NASA by services. Then we see this middle ground we call the proving ground. It's around cislunar space. And these are the, where we need to solve those problems and understand the risk tolerance and the, the ability to go distances as far as mm -hmm. Mars. And then the last region is, is really the Earth uh, independent region. And that's where you really have broken the tie back to the planet. So we've, in simplest terms, we see these three regions, Earth Reliant, Proving Ground, and Earth Independent. And we see what we're doing today is we're working really hard in this Proving Ground, building those skills to go forward. And then the other thing I would say is that in the earlier versions of this, my, my public affairs team, they had Mars real big. And mm -hmm. I made Mars the same size as Journey. To me, this is much more about the journey than it is about the destination. And I want to build capabilities and systems and things that can be used for multiple destinations that essentially allow us to push human presence into the solar system. And we're going to take the time to do that. That's part of the sustainability thing I described. It's how we move forward, how we make steady progress, and we don't get reset. So that's uh -huh. kind of our overarching goal of what we're trying to go do. Um, say a word about the space station and the trade-offs that have to, I, I think, constantly be um, thought through there, enormously expensive at a time when some of us wish you had a lot more resources for some of this. It has, it has advantages. Um, we're going, for now, it looks as though the policy will be to continue investing now for another, what, uh, 13 years or something. Yeah, yeah to 2024, 20, so roughly at least, nine, yeah, years, nine, nine years. Nine years, and, yeah. Yep. So again, I would say, I think the thing is that you, you, know, you look at the budget for space station and it's, it's $3 billion. But then if you start breaking that down, first of all, $1.6 billion is for commercial crew and cargo transportation. So that's essentially the transportation cost to keep the crew supplied. And, that's, uh, the, uh, and it's a transportation to take crews up and down from station. Right. And today we're acquiring that through the Russians. We've just done a contract now with two companies to do it with U.S. provider, which will, will come in 2017. But, but a big piece of that budget is really just transportation. So that's going to be there no matter what occurs. So that's really money that NASA doesn't do anything with. We're just essentially pushing that out. So then that leaves $1.4 billion left. $400 million of that is for research. And then the actual operation of station is a little bit less than a billion a year. And so it's a facility, you know, the size of a football field, uh, 400 metric tons on, in orbit, um, you know, a, a pretty sophisticated research facility. 15, 16 countries are participating with this activity, and we're doing that, keeping crews alive there and operating daily for a little bit less than a billion. So when, I, when you break it down to that, it's billion still a big number, but it's, it's a lot less than the three that, that's there. And I think that 1.6 for transportation would go someplace else, so that uh -huh. would not be able to go to a next, uh, next endeavor. So what we're trying to do with Station is, is expose commercial companies to the benefits of space. And so we know, for example, things behave differently in space. So uh, the, uh, the human, the bone loss, is, if you don't do anything, is roughly, I think, 10 to 30 percent bone loss per month, which is huge. Uh, muscle wasting is another thing that occurs. Immune system degrades. So what you can do in, in space eyesight, is... Eyesight, I think. Yep, and mm -hmm. the eyesight, uh, the intracranial pressure also is a, is a problem that occurs. So we have to solve these problems for NASA's needs, but they also have benefits here on Earth. So we're trying to expose commercial companies like you know, Eli Lilly and Merck and Amgen to the advantages of doing research in space. So we have the ability to fly rodents to space. You can give them a, a bone loss prevention drug, um, and they'll... And then we have a bone densitometer, a little device you put a rodent in, and it tells the density of the rodent's bones. It's the same device used on the ground, so the companies are familiar with it. It's the device they use. So they can know in a matter of weeks whether this drug is effective at bone loss prevention or not. So for them, that's an immediate pass-fail that they could get through ground testing, but it's going to take years to get that same kind of information. And speed is very important in business, as we were talking earlier. Mm -hmm. And so if we can expose them to the advantages of space research, 
in their own terms, so it's not such a foreign entity. They can even acquire transportation services. They'll have the ability to buy a, a capsule to take their own researchers to this facility in the future. So we're trying to use this station over these next 10 or 15 years to, to enable this commercial market. And, and I think that's really, the, that may be the most important thing we can do with space stations. So some people think about retiring the risk for Mars. Those are important to me in the agency, but I think this other other goal of trying to get the commercial sector interested in doing research and seeing the advantages and the properties of how they can use this is really good. So if you think about it from an engineering sense, sense any equation that has a G in it, you can investigate that in space by removing that G, and that gives you a new insight into a process, gives you a new model. So it ought to be an innovation accelerator for companies that are doing research in, in fields like materials, biology, et cetera. And the other one that's really intriguing to us is the uh, genomic research that's going yeah. on right now. Uh, we, you know, Mark, or Scott Kelly's going to fly to station for a year. His brother, his identical twin brother, Mark, is going to be his ground analog and we've made their genomic information available, so we'll see how Scott's genome physically changes over his year in space. And we've got a whole bunch of Nobel laureate genomic researchers that for extremely small grant money, like on the orders of 10,000 or so dollars, decided that they wanted to have this chance to look at this unique data set, so they are participating in this. So we're starting to get others that don't see space as maybe a, an economic beneficial ground to be a very intriguing space to go do research in. So if we can continue that momentum, that, that will be the real benefit for Space Station. I hope somebody's uh, ready with the first question from the audience. And how about in the blue back there? And I think you can make yourself heard. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned earlier that with obviously the political situation in Washington, the Washington campaign and every 48 years, doing long-term projects difficult in terms of the government sense. Is there a visibility um, for private organizations to do those sorts of long-term projects kind of get around that political issue? Yeah, and I would say my answer is clearly yes. I mean, what's exciting to me about, that we talked about the new companies coming online, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of them coming, and, and it's not just SpaceX, there's Blue Origin, there's a whole bunch of other little startups. Things that, that like, in, especially in the propulsion area, that I would have thought were not possible to do in the <laughs> private sector can now be done in the, in the private sector. And they have tremendous capability. So there's lots of activity that can be done and on more of an enduring basis. So again, I don't think the government needs to do everything. We need to acquire services where we can acquire services and not build things from scratch every time. But I think that's, that's one avenue that we can definitely pursue and look at. Over here. We do have mics if they're close. Here's one coming. Uh, Use it anyway. Um, sir, I was just wondering, um, could, you said that you were working a lot with uh, like the Russians and uh, in the international community. Could you explain a little bit on like what the differences are um, with our community and with their community, how they work, how we work, and kind of how we can kind of work <laughs> a little more together? I think we have to. <laughs> this is like, uh, what's it? I don't know. But it, it, it's very intriguing. I, this is the other thing that, that again, you kind of going back to your to thoughts as a student, right? If, if you had ever told me I was, you know, I had never been outside of the United States before I went to Russia for the first time during the Mir program, right? And if somebody would have told me I was going to Russia, I would have said, there's no way. And, and so again, if you just kind of be flexible, amazing things can happen. And I've got, I had the privilege of working with the Russians on the Mir program, which was tremendously insightful. Um, I think they sh the cool thing is they share the same passion we do for exploration. Their motivations to, to uh, do things in space is there. Their engineering philosophy is very similar to ours. They maybe even have a longer range horizon than, than we do. Um, I mean, that's tremendously, tremendously positive and, and helps us move forward. If I look across the international community, I think they have more of an interest in the moon, potentially, than we do. And again, I think that's driven by the fact that we've, we've landed uh, Americans on the moon. Maybe that's a piece of it, but they really are interested in the moon. I don't see that as incompatible with what we describe here. We're going to have to go around the moon in this cislunar space, to, to, in this proving ground, to build skills and techniques and orbital mechanics and 
and trajectories to go to places like Mars. While we're there, if there's interest in their part to do a lander and take crews to the surface of the moon, we would clearly support that. So that's very synergistic. So, so we meet a lot with countries and, and talk about things. They share basically the same passions we do. They, it's, we have a global exploration roadmap, which is put together by 18 countries of their basic plan or framework for what they want to do in space, and it really aligns very clearly with what we're doing. So I think it's another thing that I think is really important is just as we talked about, it's no longer just one government working the activities. There's private sector that comes alongside. I think also international will be a wave of the future. So this is another thing to learn at, at here at school is to think about opportunities to learn another language or to interact with, with other students with different cultures. To, to get that cultural diversification is tremendously important and will be a real, really, really important to your careers. It's striking to think about, um, and it was, it was brought up in our commission many times that that a world that has trouble co coordinating on almost any other basis has been able uh, over quite a long time now to cooperate very effectively in, in space exploration. In the worst of the Cold War, then in a period in which uh, it seemed everyone generally agreed about institutions, now we're at odds with Russia about a lot of things, but not, not in your world. It's, yeah. it's a very encouraging thing. Yeah, again, I think that big challenge, right, we all recognize we can't accomplish accommodate or can't accomplish that challenge without us all working together. So we have to, to not look at the differences, but look at where we're alike and figure out a way to move forward as a team. Right there in the, uh, let's start with the red sleeves. Yeah. Thanks. So you talked briefly about possibly having NASA go back to kind of the Apollo way of here's a date, let's get there by this date. Obviously that seems like it might be a little bit hard to do, but is there any talk at NASA of somehow trying to have more of a firm goal, like saying this is ultimately what we want to do and work with current and future administrations to stay with that and kind of kind of moving, are we going to Mars, are we asteroid redirecting, and so forth? Again, I think this is one of the difficult things we struggle with, and, and we had a lot of discussions with the NRC about this very subject. You know, I want to, you know, my ultimate goal is we want to push human presence into the solar system, but that's not sufficient. That's too soft. That's too flexible. We need some near-term milestones that are measurable with a date that moves forward. Maybe not particularly destinations or particular short-ended things, but everything we need to do needs to feed forward or, or to, to branch forward into the next mission. So we talk about this asteroid redirect mission that we've been proposing. It's not so much about the mission itself, but it's a technique or it's a, it's a mission that lets us build skills for Mars-class things. So the solar electric propulsion bus will have 12 tons of xenon on board. Um, it will be used to essentially redirect an asteroid or 500 metric tons into the distant retrograde orbit around the moon. When we started looking at that, we said, we could, hey, we could pre-position cargo at Mars with almost the same spacecraft. So why don't we just use the same spacecraft? So we're going to build a solar electric propulsion bus that satisfies this asteroid mission, but that's really not what it's for. It's really for that future Mars mission to deliver cargo first to the vicinity of Mars, and then crew will follow on a much faster rocket, on the chemical propulsion rocket later. So I think, again, we've got to do a better job of articulating near-term objectives and letting administrations pick some of those near-term objectives. So they have fingerprints on it, something that can be accomplished within their horizon, in the shorter horizon. But it's fitting in this bigger framework of these pieces fit into this bigger picture. So here's how you can contribute to this bigger vision. Help us with these three or four things and, and actually give them a choice of selections when a new administration comes in. Which ones of these things would your administration like to work on? Let them pick on it and pick those, and then we can accomplish those and make sustained, continuous progress forward. So that's what we're trying to describe with this fancy chart behind us. And it's very secondary, and it would never be reason enough in itself, but our commission heard a lot of, of uh, testimony about the need for, you, they would usually say tempo, meaning events that were frequent enough that, that they maintained, they built maybe a little sense of momentum and excitement in the public, that if you go years between without any contact, any, any uh, Thing new uh, involving man in space, uh, what's already sort of tepid interest kind of weakens further. I, I, I mean, look at the exploration flight test one we did in December, right? Uh -huh. 
I, I mean, I was really, I was blown away by the excitement that yeah. the general public had about this test mission to look at the heat shield and reentry. And, and I thought, wow, we need to do more of these things, right? So we're going to try to talk about demonstrable milestones. We have a big solid rocket motor test firing coming in, in March of this year. We'll yeah. do in Utah. That's the boosters that will be used with the space launch system. We're building the Orion capsule now, the next one for the exploration mission one. Um, now in, uh, in, in Michoud is getting welded together. So we're going to try to figure out ways to get the public and folks mm -hmm. more excited about, about things moving forward. But I think we definitely need to do that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, in your opinion, what is the role of space tourism, both in the short term and the long term, when it comes to human space flight? Is that like a fad, or do you think that's really going to be a big industry in the future? Wow. I, I don't know. What do you think, right? <laughs> How many of you want to be space tourists? All right. All right. So, well, maybe, maybe I've answered yeah, the question yeah, yeah. just by you raising your hands, right? It appears that there's research. a market here. <laughs> Now, how much, what price point can you pay? Yeah. <laughs> but we need to ask that next question, yeah. right? Let's say they cost $50 million a flight, right? How many of you could go for a tourist at $50 million, right? Now that kind of cut down the amount of tourists <laughs> here. So maybe, maybe we're doing an actual uh, yeah. survey here of the audience of what makes sense and doesn't make sense. I think there's clearly a price point where it's interesting. I don't know. I, I, find it interesting. I also find it interesting the way that folks are trying to achieve it. There's Virgin Galactic, which is, which is going to do suborbital, yep. which is a lot easier, as you know, from, a, from an energy standpoint than going orbital. Um, there's the, potentially the, the services we're getting for commercial crew from NASA. Those will be, the spacecraft will be owned by the companies, and they will be able to offer tourist flights in those. There's some balloon things that are coming now that, that give you, a, you know, a uh, you know, Worldview is, is one that just recently did some tests, I think, over this weekend, where they go up to, I think, 130,000 kilometers wow. and, and look over the Earth and give you that sense, a little longer than the short parabola flight of Virgin. So I think there's opportunities coming, and I think we need to, I think more people that can experience space, the better off we are. So I support tourism in that sense to getting folks exposed to it and, and move forward. But I think you know, our role, in government at least, is to do the things that, that don't quite make economic sense yet. And as soon as they make economic sense, we give them off to the private sector. I probably shouldn't tell this story, but I was talking to a Purdue alum who has purchased not one but two seats on Virgin Galactic. I forget what number, 100 and something in line. And the second seat is apparently very adventuresome spouse. And I said, Oh, well, are you going to go on sequential flights, you know, because like a lot of people don't travel even on the same airplane. He said, nope, if I don't come back, she's not coming back. So, <laughs> so there's, a, there's a strong marriage for you. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. So I hear a lot of um, old space terms and new space terms. So how do we start to bridge that gap and shift from a space race to a collaborative environment? Well, I call it now space. Not old or new. And since it's a NASA acronym, I, I uh, highlight the capital W uh, uh -huh. in, in, in there. But I, I honestly believe that we're really one, one space team working together. And it's, it's, I, it, now space is really what it is. And it's, we take the best from where they're available from the private sector. We take the best from the government side. And we work together as one seamless team. And I think you're starting to see that, that that come together. I was just in a conference in D.C. and it was amazing seeing kind of the, the, the previously once thought of as new space folks talking about the more legacy programs and all of a sudden we found out there was like real, real understanding and we really want to do the same thing. So I think you'll start seeing some of that, that change as we move forward because again the challenge is bigger than either one of us. How do we both work together to accomplish the challenges that we want to go do and, and that's, that's when the real progress starts occurring. And we, I think you're starting to see big, big moves afoot in that direction. I've always had trouble. It always felt like a false distinction to me anyway. In the Apollo days, a huge percentage of everything in the spacecraft was built by private contractors. They had other business aspirations, and likewise today. I mean, um, maybe by degree, but there's nothing, there's nothing new about, about the team, about the partnership. So. Let's see. Yes, sir, back in the... Light colored shirt, yeah. Sure. 
During its nearly six decade history, NASA and other US government space policy agencies have often been subjected to withering criticism for their uh, for problems with strategic management. One thing I've wondered is whether or not NASA should uh, could be more effective in its management if it trans heard its uh, aeronautics responsibilities to the uh, Federal Aviation Administration and just focused exclusively on space science? Well, I don't know. I, I need uh, Jay Wan Shin here from the Aeronautics Directorate to answer that question. I, <laughs> his budget is pretty small in the big scheme of things. We work with the Aeronautics Directorate quite a bit on the, the uh, Curiosity rover, the entry heat shield. It had... Uh, it was instrumented to, to go look at the entry, descent, and landing problems for us, and we worked extensively with the aero community to do that. So there's still still some natural tie between the aero, the aero community and what we do. Also, a lot of the high-speed entry stuff uh, with shuttle, et cetera, was, we did some boundary layer transition things with the aero school as well, so, so with the aero department, rather. And, and we need to, to look at that, but I don't know if that would save or help in the big scheme of things. Yes, sir. So, given the demonstrated capacity for commercial uh, cross tank to develop um, not just crew passengers but the health of vehicles, um, absent a, a mandate from Congress, do you believe that SLS would have been the best way for NASA to develop a heavy lift capacity? Or would NASA have been open to a commercial cross tank for a heavy lift vehicle? Again, I think if you use kind of the market discussion as a, as a guide, there's not a lot of need for a 130 metric ton class vehicle to low Earth orbit. So I'm not sure there would have been enough interest on the commercial side to invest in that, and it would have ended up essentially being a government program anyway. And, and what we did with SLS is we, we tried to not push a lot of new technologies. The shuttle main engines are, will be used for the first four flights underneath SLS. The solid rocket boosters are derivatives of, um, of what we had with the shuttle again. Um, the, uh, the, the big change with SLS is manufacturing. So we have reaction friction stir weld for the large tanks down in uh, New Orleans. It takes about 10 to 20 folks to actually do the weld process for one of these big barrel sections, whereas it took probably on the order of hundreds to thousands in the external tank world. So we're taking advantage of modern manufacturing to lower production costs so we can have a very low flight rate but still have an affordable system. So I think because there wasn't enough of a market yet for the private sector, it, it, it's probably better done by the, the government to do that. But then maybe once it becomes operational, then we hand that off to a private sector to go use and, and go manufacture and fly for us in the future. You know, we envision a flight rate maybe one, two, three flights a year. That's not really enough for a company to make a market with. Whereas in the case of crew transportation, they see potentially the tourist market as being a reason that they would invest um, they also see potentially this research market I talked to you about is another reason to invest. So those companies are willing to put some money forward, and so there's not just a NASA investment. So we use kind of is there a is there a market beyond the government for these particular applications as a judge of whether this is something we want to pursue with industry or we want to pursue internally. Thank you. Great question. Uh, right there. Going forward, what is NASA's timeline as far as um, the Orion projects, um, developments with SLS going to Mars? Um, what are the specifics for that next nine, ten years going forward on, on your front? Okay. It, again, I would say the next big milestone, we have an uncrewed uh, SLS Orion flight sometime in 2018, and that's still a ways away. Um, and another exciting thing about Orion is the uh, service module will be provided by the European Space Agency. So what's exciting is we're already starting to do joint exploration beyond low Earth orbit with international partners. So we put that in right at the beginning. Then the first crewed flight is in 2021 or 2022, and then we intend to fly about once a year to the proving ground to space after that 2021, 2022 timeframe. And what's really driving that is really kind of the funding level we're at and what we can do moving forward. Um, it also takes a long time just to build these large, these large systems. And, and the amount of engineering that goes into this, this, uh, this activity is, is pretty monumental if you go look at those activities. So I'd like those dates to be earlier, but, 
but they're just about where they can be just based on the, the amount of hardware we need to put together, the amount of activity that it actually takes to physically go put these, uh, these spacecraft together. On the aisle back there. Go ahead and shout it if you can't get a mic. Uh, you talk about gauging interest from other industries, like the pharmaceutical industry, for supporting the ISS and accelerating progress. How are you going to gauge industry, uh, interest from industries outside of aerospace to support the journey to Mars, or perhaps what new industries do you see developing from this? Again, we, we created a, a nonprofit organization, the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, the CASIS organization. And we created them to be separate from NASA so they could reach out to commercial companies and talk to a commercial company like they're used to understanding, you know, in terms of revenue and time to, to uh, product and, and those kind of terms that, that are hard for us in the government side to discuss with a company. So we, we've got them reaching out. They're, they've done a couple conferences. They're going to do one this summer in Boston. The idea is to reach out to pharmaceutical companies, materials companies, different researchers and show them. What's interesting is I would say now we, we have breadth where we have a lot of interest at a very low level within many companies, but it's at the individual research, researcher level, it's not at the research department level. So a researcher may see promise in a materials or a protein crystal growth or maybe even a fluid flow phenomena, but he hasn't told his boss yet what he's doing. He's spending his discretionary funds to do a little bit of research through CASIS on board the space station. So I think we're at that, at that very first starting level, and I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. I think if you're going to create a new economy or a new market, it's at least a 10-year activity, probably longer than that. So we don't have a very long time with station. So we are doing everything we can to get as many folks excited about the advantages of microgravity research and let them discover in their own words how they can turn that around into a profit and make it into something that's beneficial. So this is a huge challenge for us. So we're, we're doing this with a separate organization outside of the agency. We're trying to move this as fast as we can and, and we welcome any suggestions from anybody in these areas of, of ways to do it better. And let me, let me just, yeah. Ask you a question. This is, this is, this is only fair, right? Since we didn't discuss here. this. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you, when you uh, ran the, or you co-chaired the NRC report, yeah. what did you learn that surprised you? What was different about the agency or space flight that you didn't anticipate based on your past government yeah. and past experiences? Well, I had so much to learn. I, the, one, one thing, that I think the single biggest surprise was, we already talked about, was that looking back over the history of, public opinion research and so forth, that uh, I thought there would have been much more of a fluctuation. And in fact, it's it hardly ever topped or, or even approached 50% of the American people who were enthusiastic about it. That came as, as uh, news to me. I think the, uh, I became increasingly impressed uh, with the uh, testimony, again, that we've discussed, of how really hard Mars is. Anybody who blithely asserts that and sort of solve this problem, that problem in two or three or four years, didn't listen to the same people we listened to or that were a part of the, uh, of the commission. I just became increasingly, uh, I was, you know, it was disappointing, both those in a way, but it, it, facts are facts. And, um, and you, you roll all that together and it just means that the, the challenge for you and, and other NASA and, and for all, all of us who are space advocates uh, uh, is, uh, is really a tall one. Um, in the, uh, uh, you know, I for one don't think it's quite good enough to have a menu and, and just continue to accept short-term decision making. You know, the, 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 the sound bite when we summed up for the, uh, at the release of our report, I I'd probably, I know, oversimplifying, but I said, if you want to understand our report, the real question is, do you want to go to Mars or don't you? And if you do, there are several fundamental changes in the way the government has run NASA that, that they'd have to make, and if, if not, then we've, it'll be a lot longer than two decades. We got time for one or two more. Uh, how about this gentleman, and then we'll come up front. Well, once you get to Mars, um, what would you do next? And are we making decisions now uh, to have you boys in Pioneer and involved in the future of our goal in the next What would happen after that? Yeah, and, and, and this is exactly what we talk about is 
I, I've talked about this solar electric propulsion bus, and, and there's a senior design class that's, that's off looking at uh, Buzz Aldrin's cycler concept, where essentially a spacecraft is a continuous loop between the Earth and Mars. So we, we, we definitely want to leave infrastructure and hardware around that can then be you know, used to branch out to do bigger and better things. So I think you're exactly right. We, you know, at first we were kind of looking at Mars as, as, as maybe just a one-off kind of mission, much like Apollo, but that is not where we want to go. We want to take the time to build it sustainable. So we've, we've got Mars now as a staging base to go forward. This Proving Ground region looks really intriguing. Uh, there's all kinds of trajectory analysis that can come out of the distant retrograde orbit, the Lagrangian points L1 and L2 that allow us to go to various locations throughout the solar system. So again, I think we need to go look at, at where it makes sense for a robot to go and where it makes sense for a human to go and when is the right time for a human to go. But I think we need to get that plan and have that discussion there. And we have not done a good job yet of looking beyond that. But, but that's why I talk more about the journey piece and not so much about the destination. If we get too focused on the destination, then it's a short-term sprint and we have not left anything behind it that really allows us to move forward. Well, we're just about out of time. I've, I've been saving a question because I thought someone else might ask about robotic space exploration. So. Let me try to pose it this way, Bill. Um, talk just for a minute, first of all, about the advantages, as you see them, of humans in, in space. What is it? Why would we, why do we, should we risk human life and all the extra cost that goes into human space exploration? You know, someone will say, hey, we can send, pick your number, 50 rovers to Mars for the same, or 200 for the same amount of money. So. First of all, do humans still have a, um, a great advantage as, uh, as, as the exploring uh, a species, let's say? That's my first question. Yeah, I think there's really, there's, there's two pieces to this. One, one clearly is just uh, there's a time when robots are the right thing to go do. We have a radiation monitor today driving around on the Curiosity rover on Mars measuring the radiation environment for crews. Um, and that's clearly a good role for a, for a robot to go, to go do. On the Mars 2020 rover, we're going to fly a device that will pull oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere. So we'll actually see if we can grab oxygen out of the atmosphere for crews to eventually to breathe some, someday in the future. So again, we're using the robotics to kind of pave the way for the human. Robotics, you can do tremendous things today with robotics. But with the time delays and the activities, if you look at the rovers, I think they've driven about a marathon's worth of mileage on, on <laughs> Mars. If you look at what the astronauts did on the moon and, and their rovers, dramatically different. Yeah. So the human physically being there, the uh, intuition of the human being there, the geologist that can look at rock A and rock B and, and, and see the interesting one, there's a real speed of the human right. being there, but there's a big burden with that human being there in that situation. Right. So you need to use that, that intuition, that ability of the human to adapt and change in, in real time to maximize that learning and then move forward. So I think there's a, clearly a role for both. So it's not, I think it's wrong to say it's either or, it is really both working together that, that make this, this a, a venture that works and makes sense. And the aspirational aspects, again, um, our commission came to the conclusion that if you just try to tote up the quantifiable, tangible benefits of human, human space exploration, you can't probably catch up to the cost. But there are these intangible, the inspiration of young people and the drawing of the best talent to science and engineering and so forth, and, and just the, you know, the, the, the enlarging of the human spirit, you know, yeah. go where no one's ever gone. Um, can't put a number on it, but it's really very real, Yes. right? Um, and yet, uh, 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 in our report, we included one paragraph just for the distant future that I sat, uh, sort of insisted on, which said, we don't know, we can't know, given how long this is going to take, that advances in, oh, artificial intelligence, which are moving very quickly, biotechnology, might not change that such that the, advantage, the advantages would shift to whatever we'd call it at that point. Yeah. It, it's, it's really an intangible. It was interesting when I asked how many of you wanted to be tourists, right? Yeah. And I got so many hands, right? 
you know, how many of you would want to put on some Oculus Rift gla glasses, right, and walk on Mars, or would you really want to mark, walk on Mars yeah. yourself, right? There's something about the human spirit that's innate in us that makes us want to explore. You know, as, as small children, we learn by exploring and physically interacting with our world. Children really gain knowledge and the ability to walk and communicate by interacting physically with others and their environment. To do that virtually gets you so far, but I don't think it gets you to what it really means to be human. This is really philosophical, but, but this is hard for an engineer to say. But, but, I think you're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> but, 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 but I think there's a piece of what it really means for us to be human, and I think we will be pushing ourselves into the solar system for reasons that are stronger that, that we can't articulate with some equation or some, some economic, socioeconomic benefit right. analysis. So anyway. Well, Bill Gerstenmeyer, thank you so much for, um, you just have no idea how proud this university is of you and all you've done. I'll just sort of venture the following that, um, that uh, so, so here you've just heard from, uh, from someone who is brilliant, uh, who's solid, who has a lifelong uh, record of just getting the job done, uh, and yet is very unassuming and modest about all that. And, you know, the way I think about it, if, if you didn't know he was a boiler maker, you could figure it out just listening. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.